Hello, hello. Are we live? Yep. Looks like I am, I think. Stream just froze. All right. Yeah, there we go. I need to wait for it to unfreeze so I can unmute it and kill the echo. Or mute it, not unmute it. Okay, there we go. All right, welcome back to my font project. We are parsing fonts from TTF files and then rendering them to an image. So I can run my program and it will typeset some text. Uh, on the last stream, we did compound glyphs. So now we can do things like the letter A with umlauts or uh, that might be the only compound glyph in this example. Uh, in some fonts, the letters like lowercase i and lowercase j are compound fonts, uh, or compound glyphs, sorry. Uh, so a compound glyph is a glyph which is made up of other glyphs, which are components, and then they can be translated and scaled and rotated in various ways. It's so like the dot above the i or the two dots above the a uh, could be components. Uh, it's, it's sort of arbitrary how they break things up, how they break contours up in the components. Uh, like the two dots could be one component, or it could be two components, or, or the whole thing might just be one simple glyph. Uh, it depends on the font. Uh, in this case, at least, there's one letter in here. Uh, not 100% sure which one, but probably the A, which has two components. Uh, and then in some of this text, we have a few one-component glyphs. Uh, the way that that might work is that in the Cyrillic alphabet, some of these glyphs might just be references to the same looking glyph in the Latin alphabet, like this letter in Russian. Uh, it looks like a B, but it sounds like a V when you pronounce it. Uh, that It might just be exactly the same as the Latin B, uh, similar with this lowercase a. Uh, and then what this library does, uh, it produces an image so is this, yeah, this is up to date. So we have German text, uh, Russian, Devanagari. I'm not sure if this is Hindi or another language, but the script is Devanagari. Uh, and then we have Greek text. So that's what this library does. It renders text, it parses a font, it renders text in that font to an image. Uh, and then we can change the text, for example. So if we want to put some French words in there with more compound glyphs, uh, we can do this uh, and rerun it. Now we have a few more glyphs with two components. Uh, it's probably this A with the circumflex. I, I don't know the names of all of these accents. Uh, but then this C is probably also a compound glyph where the C is one component and, and the hook at the bottom of the C is a separate component. So we can reload that image. And there we go, Hotel Francais. Uh, I don't speak French, so sorry if I mispronounced that. But you get the idea. Uh, by the way, that also does upright letters or regular a regular font and an italic font from the same typeface. Uh, we can also change the font. So instead of Noto Sans, which I am now doing as my default, because Computer Modern is nice, but Computer Modern only has Latin, Cyrillic, and Greek, uh, Noto Sans has a lot more other languages like uh, Devanagari. Uh, yeah. So uh, we can do this with a different font. For example, Calibri. That is on Windows. It's installed into the C Windows fonts directory, and the name is just calibri.ttf. So I can type out the name of that font as a command line argument. Uh, and we get a bunch of warnings because I think Devanagari is not in Calibri. So yeah, we, we get German and Russian and French, but the Taj Mahal is all unknown glyphs in Calibri. I thought Windows had something, maybe not.
which one is just regular. There's regular aerial. Yeah, so we still have undefined glyphs. But the idea is that you can render text in different fonts. Uh, and as long as your font has glyphs for the language that you want to typeset, it will work. Otherwise, you'll get these unknown glyph boxes, which are usually a box with like an X or a question mark. Or for Arial here, it's just a box with nothing inside the box. Uh, by the way, another name for this unknown glyph box is called Tofu, because it, I guess Tofu is frequently cut into a square shape. Uh, so one of the reasons that the font Noto Sans is named Noto, uh, I have it here. This, this is in my repository, so if, if you clone this, you get this font for free. Uh, unless you're running Windows, you won't be able to use uh, like Arial or Calibri or Windows licensed, licensed fonts because I can't distribute those and you wouldn't download a font, would you? You're better than that. You wouldn't steal a font. Uh, yes, yeah, so Noto. Let's do Noto bold. Yeah. A anyway, uh, the reason one of the reasons that Noto is named Noto is because this means no tofu. Uh, the goal of that font is to have glyphs for almost every language and reduce the number of tofu characters or those unknown glyph boxes that you get when you render uh, some some language. Uh, yeah. So. Calibri doesn't have this these uh, this Abu Gita, uh, but Noto Sans does. Now, uh, what I wanted to do today is I'm testing my project with a few fonts. If I run my testing script, uh, it runs a bunch of unit tests. So there are 14 tests total. A lot of these are like lower level things like just writing basic PPM images with rectangles or uh, testing my Unicode encoding and decoding functions. Uh, but as far as fonts go, I think I'm only testing like four or five different fonts. Uh, we might be able to quickly count. So we have Computer Modern. That's the font from LaTeX. We have Ubuntu. A lot of these test regular and italic, but I'm just going to count those fonts as one typeface. We have Garamond, or at least one, uh, one modern digitization of Garamond. We have Bodoni, uh, and then we have Noto Sans. So right now I have five fonts being tested. Uh, what I want to do today is test a bunch of fonts. So this Windows fonts directory has, I think, about 300 TTF files. Uh, so if we list all the TTF files, there's a bunch of stuff. If we count those using the handy Linux WC to count lines, there we go. We have 316 fonts installed here on Windows. Uh, so in one of my earlier streams, I verified checksums in all 316 of these files, or actually only 315 because I had an issue with Corbelli on the stream that I wasn't able to figure out live. I did get it fixed eventually, but all I did was verify checksums. I didn't really do anything with the fonts. Uh, so today I would like to render text in as many of these fonts as we can. I expect that some of them won't work. I can only support uh, CMAP formats 0 and 4 right now. Uh, CMAP is the table that maps Unicode code points to glyph indices in the font because not every font supports every character. As you saw when we got those tofu boxes where these these characters should be. Uh, yeah, so CMAP handles that and there, there are about half a dozen different CMAP formats and I only support two of them. So I expect that I won't be able to handle all of the fonts that are on Windows. Some things might break. Uh, we might get We'll certainly get unknown glyph warnings. Uh, we might get some errors where my library exits gracefully, and we might we might even crash my library. I don't know because I haven't tested these yet. Uh, because so far I don't have a way to batch process a bunch of different fonts. Uh, before we get to non-Latin languages, I would like to do this with basic Latin examples. Uh, like in my 
So this, yeah, this is the Noto Sans specimen that I'm using for unit testing. Uh, so, so I produced this image as part of my tests, and I also have the image saved separately in my repository as what I expect the output to look like. And then I compare with every commit what my code outputs compared to this expected baseline, and I see if they're the same or not. Uh, so, so this is a test specimen. It has the English alphabet. Uh, I'd like to do something like this, but without the non-Latin glyphs. Uh, so yeah, let's let's change the main program to do something like this instead of uh, instead of all of these non-Latin glyphs. Uh, I think I just want to copy from one of the tests. So some of these tests have a factor where I can like scale up the resolution. And I have that. It's, it's, is it a constant? Where is this? Okay, yeah. Yeah, so it's defined right here. And like if I want to double the resolution, I can set this to two. Uh, so I want to use this test because not all of my tests have that factor. So this is a good example. Uh, let me yank that. And do I want to put this in my main program or do I want to put it in my library? I think I kind of want to have a like a specimen subroutine that just makes a specimen for a font. Uh, obviously, I'm going to have to have some text hard coded, or maybe I'll have arguments for them. Like I want, I want sort of the name of the font which we can get that from the file name somehow. Maybe the casing and, and the white space will be slightly different, but we can get something close to the name of the font. Uh, and then I can just hard code these three letters and, and the large sized letter. And the alphabet, is, I always want the Latin alphabet and numbers zero through nine. Uh, and then I can have some other text here, which is either hard coded or the subroutine might have an argument for it. So the point is, I, I think I want a subroutine that makes a specimen for a font. And then maybe later we, we can refactor these, all these unit tests to reuse that. Uh, these also use different colors though, so maybe not, like I don't think I want to add arguments for every single color in the specimen. So let's, let's put this in the library. Uh, I'm just going to call it specimen. Not sure what the arguments are going to be. Definitely the TTF, uh, and maybe some strings or some output file names. So let's have an argument for that, for the for the TTF file name. Yeah. Um, I guess do I want to take the file name as an argument, or just just the TTF struct after it's already read? Well, I, I want to have. I want to have the name of the font in the specimen. So let's pass the file name as an argument, and then this thing will read the font as well. going to bother with italic, at least not yet. Sometimes the names are related, like a lot of the things that I download from Google opens open fonts are consistently named, named with like the name of the font dash regular or dash italic. 
So if, if you give the name of the regular font, we could sort of figure out what the italic name is and try to parse that TTF file as well. Uh, but the Windows fonts are different. Like the way that the Windows fonts are named, uh, like if we look at everything that starts with Arial, yeah, we have Arial and then Arial I for italic and BD for bold and BI for bold italic. So that, so there's there's some convention there too, but it's different from the Google Open Fonts convention. So in general, it's not really possible to get the italic font file name from the regular font file name. Uh, but you, you, could, you could have some rules to like code up some conventions and try every possible convention. I'm not going to do that, though. at least not tonight. Uh, let's just put some placeholder text in here. Again, this is just placeholder. Uh, and this is going to be a little bit rough, but let's just tack on .ppm to the end of whatever the TTF extension is. Uh, so it's, it's going to have like doubled extension, like it's going to be font.ttf.ppm. Uh, we can leave this as a variable for now. And then th this isn't a test, so we're not going to compare it to any other image. We're just going to write an image and not compare it to anything. Uh, so, I do want this to be a variable. So we're just gonna we're just gonna have double extensions for now. Uh, eventually, I might have like a search and replace, but I don't want to. I don't want to waste time on string algorithms in Fortran because Fortran doesn't have like a search and replace function by default. You have to scan for the period yourself and then replace after that position. It's not hard, but I just don't feel like doing it right now. And it's not built into the language, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, so this is going to read the font in here. Uh, I think that's it, and then we just need to call this routine from our main program. So instead of all this stuff, We still need to get the command line arguments because that has the name of the TTF file. Like, like I want to have a batch script which runs around this program. So the batch script is going to supply the TTF name and then this is going to parse that from a command line argument, which it already does. Uh, and then we just call specimen with the TTF file name argument. Or here it's just TTF file, not TTF file name. But that, that's what I want. So let's see if that works. We do not have arguments for those. And then TTFI, we don't have any italic yet. So we're just going to draw the regular font here. Uh, 
Yeah. That's okay for now. Maybe in the future this will take two arguments, the regular file name and the italic file name, but, uh, but that's going to be difficult to batch. Uh, by the way, I fixed up all of my compiler warnings off stream, uh, and then I enabled this compiler flag w error, which treats warnings as errors. This way, every time a warning crops back in, uh, it's treated as an error, and then I have to address it. Uh, I found that like every time I clean up warnings, I just let more warnings creep back in as I develop. So I might get tired of it and take this out, but for now I'm going to try to be strict and make myself address warnings as soon as they come up. So that would usually be a warning, but because of that flag it's treated as an error. got more of them. Really? Oh, this is in my main program now. Because we're not really doing anything in main. In here. So we're going to have args, and I think that's about it. Should just delete this stuff rather than comment it. But like, yeah, I might want to put it back later. I, I haven't decided yet. I haven't really decided what I want my main program to be. This is more of a library. Uh, this, this is a library, and then the main program is only there because I need something to run. Uh, but I also have the unit tests, so that's another program, and then like what do I want the actual program to be? I think eventually I want it to be like something that takes a JSON file as input, and then that JSON file will define a bunch of stuff. It will define the TTF file name, and maybe an italic font file name, uh, and things like the resolution, uh, and the line spacing, and maybe the letter spacing if I uh, add an option for that and then some payload of text to render, either just a plain string or maybe in markdown format. Uh, so eventually I, I want to have like a main program that has more options rather than having things hard-coded in my main program that I have to recompile every time I want to change it. Uh, but, but this is more, the, the focus of this project is more on the library, so I've been focusing on the library. Uh, yeah, well, it looks like this ran. It apparently produced an image, and it's also in the same directory as my TTF file. So that's going to be a pain. I, I think I want multiple arguments, because if I try to write something in the Windows directory, it's not going to run unless I'm admin. Uh, let's discard everything, and let's open up that thing that it just wrote. Come on. So that looks like it worked. Uh, the positioning isn't right, at least not for this font. So I'm going to move the Q to the left and the headline to the left. See what that looks like. Okay, let's not move the the queue that far to the left. Let's move them down because this placeholder that says my font name, that's going to be the file name, and that could potentially be long, so that might extend through the queue, and I don't want things to collide with each other. So let's change these Y positions. Then let's move that back to the right a little bit by 50 pixels, or 50 times whatever the factor is, but the factor is 1.
I think I'm satisfied with that. I, I just want to see if I can get something for as many fonts as I can. So this doesn't have to be perfect, but now I want to try to batch this. Uh, and, and I really do want the file name here, uh, because if there are mistakes or things that aren't rendered correctly, I want to know which font is problematic, other than like looking at the file name somewhere else. So it's, it, it'll be nice if it's in the image. Uh, the problem is this is the full path to the font. Do this, but it's gonna look. It's gonna be all this, and I don't necessarily want all that. It's it's gonna overflow. Actually, it's almost guaranteed. Yes, it's. <laughs> we don't even know whether this is regular or italic, other than from looking at the font, because that part of the file name is off the canvas. Uh, so I want to get like the base name of the TTF file, which is the file name without any path and without any extension. Uh, I think Intel Fortran has some built-in routines for that, but as far as I know, G Fortran doesn't. So I might have to might have to write my own base name implementation. A lot of programming languages have this, like Bash has something for this default, but uh, built into the language, I mean. This is somebody else's library string for. I'm sure it's fine, but I would like to avoid dependencies. really dissatisfied whenever I read Stack Overflow posts about Fortran, because I hear a lot of people say this, Fortran isn't a good language to work with strings. I don't believe that. I think Fortran is basically as good as anything else for strings. You just have to learn the names of the functions that you need to work with strings. And you need to you need to declare things like this so that they don't have like a fixed upper size. Uh, you might find a lot of legacy code which doesn't do this and has like character length equals 128, and then if your string is longer than 128 characters, you're fucked. Uh, but like as long as you know how to work with strings, Fortran isn't bad for strings in my opinion. Uh, but yeah, like the Stack Overflow post has nothing about what I was actually looking for. So that's basically what I want, but I don't want to take in a dependency for this. Uh, I, I think Intel Fortran... It's like part of their IF port module. I must have just been reading through the manual one day at work that I found it because I, I can't find it with Google. Uh, I kind of want to find it. Even though I'm using G Fortran, I just want to show this example.
let's get file info qq. No. Find file. Ah, uh, breaks a full, it's split path QQ. It's gotta be this one. Yeah, it gives you the path and the drive and the directory and the base name, really, and the extension. Uh, but this, this is part of Intel Fortran. It's not part of the Fortran standard and G Fortran doesn't have it as far as I know. Uh, split path QQ. I don't know why all of these end in QQ. That's what Intel Fortran tends to use for their Fortran portability extensions. <laughs> Very little Google results about this. I think I'm just going to have to write my own. Uh, it's not too hard. You scan for slashes from the end, and then when you hit the first slash, uh, that's the beginning of your base name, and then you scan for dots from the end. No, you scan for dots from after the last slash, and if there is no slash, you scan from the beginning. So there, there are a few intricacies for this. Uh, you have to be careful. Like if if there is no ex if there is no extension or there is no slash, you still have to, you still want to return something. Uh, yeah, it shouldn't be too hard to implement this ourselves or myself. I, I, I speak in the third person to include like the viewers. So we're going to have a function, call it base name. I don't need a separate result because by default the result variable is just the name of the function. So I, I think base name is a good name for a variable. Uh, sometimes I have a function where it returns something like new color. I don't want the result to be new color, so I override the default and do like color instead of new color. Uh, but I think base name is a good name for a variable and the function, so I'll stick with that for this function. So by default, it's just going to be the whole string. Uh, and then if, if scanning for a character fails, then we, we use one of these bounds instead. Uh, so I want to have an integer called i for the scanning because I don't want to override these. I think the way, I can't remember whether I want scan or index. I get these mixed up all the time. 
I want one character. Uh, actually, I, I might as well use this. Yeah, I, I do want scan. So this works with a set of characters, and I want to look for either forward slashes or backslashes, because that might depend on the operating system that you're on. Uh, and then I, I just might as well use that for dots as well. And then, yep, nothing is found at zero. Can this go backwards? Yeah, it has, it has an option to scan. By default, it scans from the beginning to the end. Uh, if you set back to true, then it scans from the end to the beginning. So this is the function that I want. Uh, and first, I want to scan for slashes, because then after I get that slash, I want to scan from there to the first dot. So we scan for forward slashes on Unix-like operating systems, and we'll do backslashes too for Windows. And then I want to scan from the back to the beginning because I want to get the last slash, right? Like if we go back to here, if this is the file name, I want to find the position of this slash. So I want to find the last slash. That means I want to start scanning from the end and go to the left. And then I get the index of that slash. And then if I find that, the beginning of the string is going to be that index plus one because I want the n. I don't want I don't want to include the slash. Now, if scan doesn't find a slash, for instance, if you have a file in the current directory and you don't have any slashes in your string, uh, then this returns zero. So if that's the case, well, if that's not the case, so if i is non-zero then I have the beginning of my string. Uh, otherwise, if it doesn't find a slash, beginning is unchanged and it will just be one. Uh, so that gets the beginning index of the string and then to get to the end, I wanna start from this position where I found my slash and then scan to the first dot. That way, if you have a double extension, like if you have .ttf.ppm, like I was about to do, uh, I'll probably I'm, I'm, I'll probably fix that now. We'll start from the slash, and then we'll stop when we get to the first dot. So then the base name is just this. Like it doesn't cut. It doesn't just cut off one extension. It cuts off all the extensions. Uh, so now I don't want to scan from the back. So I leave out this argument, and then we're scanning for dots. And then again, if it's non-zero, uh, now it's going to be i minus one. And then finally, base name is file name beginning to end, uh, but like, like that with a colon. So I, I think I've handled these edge cases correctly. Uh, let's see if that works. And then I want this string to be the base name of the file name. And then I want my PPM image to use this too. Where do I want to put this image? I think I want to put it in my build directory. I think current directory makes a lot of sense. Uh, but I don't want to like have untracked files on Git. And rather than like adding a wildcard, ignore. I think I just want to put this in the build directory. So it's going to be build, uh, and hopefully that directory exists. Base name of the file name. We could just call this function once and then save it, rather than calling it twice in this subroutine. And that should fix the double extension. So let's see if this works. It doesn't. Unknown. Ah, uh, yeah, the return value. T 
TTF file name, not just file name. Oh no, it got an empty string. Uh, I do wrong here. Ah, uh, okay. I want I want to scan. I don't want to scan the whole string because what if you have a yeah, there's a dot at the start of the path. So I want to start scanning from here, and then I want to add that to, to the initial position. Uh, yeah, so. This, this will be file name from the beginning, beginning index to the end. Uh, and then I'm probably going to be off by one here because we're going to have to add it back to the beginning. Uh, let's let's see if that works. That might be off by one. Yeah, it's off by one and includes the dot. I don't want the dot. So that has to be minus two. Sure, why not? And there we go. Now it's just Notosans regular, and my output image does not have a double extension. So let's close that one. And then this is in my build directory now. Like I can delete this because it's never going to write that again. So we had one with a double dot there. There we go. Now I have the name of the font at the top at the top of my specimen image. So this is more or less what I want this to look like. I, I think I don't like the color. Well, let me do. Yeah, I think I'd like a bluish color here. And I think maybe my Fedoni test had a blue color. That's that's got to be bluish. Zero three six. So it's foreground three. So I think, I think that, I think white was, we still have white somewhere. Oh, that's black. Sorry, I, I get white and black mixed up sometimes. I can't remember which one is all zeros and which one is all Fs. Uh, so this is black, not white. There's like, shouldn't there be more white in my image because I'm using FG2, but this is black, not white. Duh. Okay, so let's rerun that. That's blue-ish now. I like that. That's. I think that's a little bit better contrast with that background at least. 
Uh, yeah, so that's one font. Now let's try it for 300. Uh, be before we do 300, let's try it for just one more. Let's run Calibri again. And now it made Calibri.ppm. Let's open that. Now, the next part that needs to be changed is I don't want to drag and drop files in the GIMP for everything that I want to look at. Uh, Windows has had various photo viewer apps throughout the years. Uh, I, I kind of liked like the older ones for Windows 7 and Windows 10. Uh, the new one, like it's a little bit too fancy. Like it will like scan every folder on your computer to look for photos. But like, I just want to view the file, the, the, the folder that I clicked on a, a photo in. Uh, but the nice thing about these Windows photo viewers is that you can use the arrow keys yeah, right there. You can use the arrow keys to go back and forth between different photos in the same folder. Uh, but it doesn't support PPM images. So what I want to do is convert these PPM images into PNG. Uh, I don't have this built into my library because, again, I want to minimize my dependencies. So that I don't want a PNG exporter built in yet. Uh, but there's this program called magic.exe, which can convert PPM files to PNG files. So I can just include this in my batch script. Uh, actually, I already have a batch script here, which will use a wildcard to convert everything. Uh, but I want to do this all in one batch. So I, I think I want this to be test win again. Like this is what we used to uh, to verify checksums. Yeah, I, actually, I, I can totally reuse this. I think Corbelli still won't work because like I manually fixed the TTF file by like padding it with zeros, but I think my program will still say that they're bad checksums. Uh, so I actually don't want to quit when I get errors. Uh, so I want to do set dash X. So I see the, actually no, I, I just don't want any non-default set things. But I think I want to take this out and attempt core belly, even if there's going to be an issue with it. And then I want to run this program magic to convert the PPM file to a PNG file. Uh, but again, I need to get the base name. Uh, see? Bash has stuff built in where, like, if you want to change an extension from PPM to PNG, this is the way that you do it. Uh, so, like, we just had to write a function ourselves in Fortran to do that, uh, but Bash has that built in. And this is not just parsing anymore, this is rendering. Now the slightly tricky part is how do I get the path of the PPM file? Uh, because in my program, I made it always use the build directory. So I have to hard code build, and then I have to get the base name in my bash script as well.
So I think I can just use the base name command. All right, let's let's test this out. Uh, it does not remove the extension, uh, but but I already know how to do that. So we're going to make a variable called ppm, and that's the name of the ppm file with the extension. Uh, no, no, we're going to—it's going to be ttf. So that's the ttf without the directory. Now the ppm is going to be in the build directory. And then it's going to have the ttf base name. But instead of dot ttf, it's going to be dot ppm. I want to close a quote somewhere. At the very end. And then the PNG is going to be the same as that, except with a PNG extension. And then the magic command is very simple. It's just going to be magic ppm PNG. And I think that's it. Let's just do one font at first. So it should only do Arial, and it didn't work. Uh, I don't. I'm gonna want to put that slash back in. Why? Oh, it did every everything in the Arial family. And now I have a bunch of PNGs. So the cool thing about PNGs is Windows, whatever the current Windows Photo app is, is it photos, is it pictures? I don't know, they keep changing it and they keep changing the name. Uh, I know, I'm an old man I'm complaining about the newfangled Windows feature, but I like the way it used to be. It takes forever to launch too. Is this what I... no. It just launched the window on my other monitor. And yeah, there we go. Finally opened the image. Yeah, so this is basically what I want with uh, only four files, but now I want to run this with like 300 files. So we have Arial, Arial Bold, Arial, Arial Bold Italic, Arial Italic, and that's it. I, I also have some other PNGs in this directory, like this six pixel test image from like one of the very early unit tests, and this larger rectangular image, and the other specimens from the unit tests. I think I actually want to clear those out. close some of these. Maybe that'll make it faster because it was really slow to open that one image. That's what I'm complaining about. Like the old Windows photo app, I swear it was not this slow. M maybe like my current computer is just slower than I than my older computers that I'm remembering. Uh, but like it shouldn't take that long to open a PNG file. I don't know. Uh, yeah, let's, let's actually rerun that with Arial again. It's going to be just the Arial family. Uh, where did this file come from? Okay, this is old. I don't know why this didn't get deleted. Yeah, 
and we have those four files again without the other stuff from the unit tests that I haven't rerun. It seems like that was a little bit faster. I don't know if it's because it's warmed up now or it's because I closed those other photos windows. Yes, the app is called Photos. Uh, yeah, let's do it with 300 files now. So this will just do everything in the fonts directory, wildcard.ttf. I think there might be some uppercase extensions too. I'm not sure if this will list those. I feel like we have uppercase things. Actually, there are a lot of them. So there are 190 of those. And there are like 300, so there's like 500 fonts total if you count both cases of the extension. So I think I can do both cases if I do it like this. I think, I, I hope that should work. Let's find out. Uh, this might actually take a while to run, so I might start this and take a break or something. I don't know, we'll, we'll see how long it takes. Aleph, Aleph regular. Arimo. Are we hitting any? Uh, I, I wanna save a log for this uh, again, because this might take a while. Uh, I, I want to tee it. I want to get the errors too. If there are any errors. My app doesn't write to STD error, uh, but like if, if it crashes or if magic hits any errors, uh, I want to try to capture that. Okay, so we're getting some CMAP unsupported things. I saw one scroll by. Let's take a look at that log. By the way, uh, the downside to using ANSI escape codes to have color-coded error messages is that when you look at them in a text editor, it, it doesn't show the colors, it just shows the literal ANSI escape code instead. Uh, so like this should be red and this should be green, but you don't see that. So there is a downside to that. Uh, anyway, errors. Oh, okay, so we're getting overflows on this hard-coded upper limit that I assigned. I think we should... Oh, good, we have one of these two by two transformations. That's good, because I, I wanna test that. Uh, and you can see I just got a lot of uh, undefined glyphs. What font is this? It's just Latin characters. CAC ST, KAC ST Office, I have no idea what that is. It seems like a lot of these fonts are rendering successfully though, so that's kind of good. Handerol apparently has CMAP format 6. Should have printed, should have printed some sort of counter in here, like like end files, because I don't know how far through all of the fonts I am. We, we could probably start to look at some of them, even if they're not all there yet. Oh, 
Oh, yeah, we're getting some crashes. Hold on. Not quite sure what to search for to find that. And I, I don't think I'm capturing it. Yeah, I think something went to STD air and I'm not capturing it. Anyway, here are some of the images that we're rendering. Well, that's a weird looking L. That lowercase L. I don't know if I like that. of sans serif fonts here. Here we go, here's a serif font. That kind of looks nice. Hey Commodore, welcome to the stream. You have a very difficult tech question. Do I think I can try to help? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. What's the question? Oh, and Dink is here too. Uh, sorry if I missed some of these chats. Uh, welcome back to the stream, Dink. If it's font related, maybe I can answer the question. If it's Fortran related, probably. Uh, if, it, if it's about anything else, probably not. So I, th I think overall this is a win. Most of these are rendering. We're seeing like every character of the alphabet and the numerals, and it's not total garbage. <laughs> What would you do if everything you liked about technology stopped existing? Because that happened to me, and I feel lost without it. Uh, how did that happen to you? Like, did, did your computer stop working? Uh, I, I was just complaining about Windows updates. Like, like, I don't like the new Photos app, whatever this is. Uh, I'm pretty sure it used to be a lot better on, like, Windows 7 uh, and e even, like, earlier versions of Windows 10. Uh, but now it feels like it feels bloated and slow and I don't like that and like I, I can't find a good free alternative I, I don't know what to do somehow on my work computer like my enterprise windows version what whatever it is like it has the old photos app and it's wonderful but like they don't have that on uh, uh, like consumer grade windows OS they just give you the new garbage photos app. And so what would I do if everything I liked about technology stopped existing? Uh, I guess I would try to build it myself. Uh, my previous project, you can look on my YouTube channel to see my archive streams. Uh, I started working on an interpreter. Uh, it's not very good, uh, but like if if technology that you like stops existing, you can always build it yourself. Uh, it's not necessarily easy. Uh, my language isn't that great, but like if, if I put years into it and, and if I like did a lot of research on compilers and interpreters, I think I could have made it decent. The climate doesn't respect the end user, and we're long past the days when all you needed to understand how things work is a simple screen driver and everything is so overcomplicated. You need a million lines of code to make the most mundane of things work. Uh, yeah, I, I, I know what you meant. Uh, Terry Davis said it's clusterfucked by the CIA on purpose. Uh, unfortunately, he's pretty schizophrenic, but like he, he's also kind of right about th the, the general idea that things are overcomplicated. Like, it, it's really hard to just make an operating system yourself. He's pretty dead. Yeah, he is pretty dead, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, like, it's really hard to make an OS yourself. And I think a lot of the stuff that he struggled with was like the bootloader and the formats for the bootloaders and uh, like hardware manufacturers not being open is there truth to that? Uh, 
the CIA part, no. Like, I don't think, like, the CIA part, the CIA is part of some conspiracy to, like, make technology unusable. But I think, like, I think technology is too commercialized and not open enough so that, like, regular people can't just make an operating system unless they're completely insane and devote their entire life to it. Carlito. Is there a movie called Carlito's Way? Never seen it. Well, at least there's a font named Carlito. Yeah, 1993. Well, I didn't know it was that old. If the CIA is morally bankrupt enough to import cocaine, they're morally bankrupt enough to do other morally objectionable things. Yeah, you're probably right. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how much they meddle in big tech, though. Uh, okay. Well, I thought this looked bad at first, but it, it's okay. Uh, the thing is, I'm not filling in the contours. I'm just drawing, like, the outline of each contour. So the way that the lowercase letter A is two different contours, it, it looks a little bit weird, but if that was filled in, it would look fine. So I think this is not a bug. This is just, I, I haven't filled in contours as a feature yet. Uh, and then this spacing is bad. Uh, it was okay for some fonts, but like not every font has the same spacing. So the headline is running into the queue. <laughs> okay, it even happens for a mono font. So I need, I need to just change this spacing. And we're done, apparently. Uh, that attempted to render 506 files. Uh, it hit errors on a lot of them. Like, there, there are 2x2 two two transformations, which I, I, I couldn't test because I didn't know which fonts used them. So I, I just left that as an error message so that like, I can remind myself to go back and like look at it to see if it, if it looks okay. Uh, because it's not just the font, I have to figure out which glyph is using that transform, and then I have to make sure to render that set and make sure it looks okay. Big Tech was funded by them. Most of Google and Facebook's funding was from the intelligence agencies, and they don't do that out of the kindness of their hearts. Yeah, uh, well, talking about morally bankrupt, uh, Google and Facebook might not always be the best role models. Uh, a lot of these are like wingdings. I, I don't care too much about wingdings. Uh, but I think we have some non-wingding fonts that had the 2x2 two two transformations. And a, a lot of them, most of these rendered. Uh, I, I didn't actually count how many worked and how many didn't work. Oh, I have a problem with the file name extension, because if it's uppercase, it doesn't work. Uh, I'm gonna close this window or minimize it. There we go. Yeah, so a lot of these rendered to PPM, but then they didn't convert from PPM to PNG because I didn't do that replacement right. When I thought tech as a kid, I thought of hardware, I thought of computers, yes, but also things that plugged into the wall that wasn't a kitchen appliance. That wasn't a computer. Uh, are, are you talking about Internet of Things? Like, like a smart fridge, or are you talking about just like a regular kitchen appliance that's not networked? Because like, I, I don't know how old you are, but like as a kid, I don't know if that stuff existed back then. It's not when I was a kid, we didn't have smart fridges.
So to to fix this lowercase versus uppercase extension, I think I just want to do two separate loops uh, because this is looking for like a lowercase extension to replace, but some, half of the time it's uppercase. I'm talking about local data or input only in entertainment appliances of the late 20th century. Yeah, yeah, like it, it, everything has a license now. Like you can't just, it, it's hard to just rip a DVD because DVDs are like, like it's licensed. It, uh, the manufacturers don't want you to make a copy of any media that you own. So yeah, that, that stuff's annoying. Uh, hello, Yumi Chan VT, welcome to the stream. Uh, I, I, I guess I've reached the part of the evening where I'm just like rambling with the chat, and that's fine because I think I did what I wanted to do. Uh, we have a batch, actually like half of them don't work, uh, but we have a batch script which renders, here's Comic Sans, by the way, uh, I happened to stop right there. Uh, yeah, we have Comic Sans, Comic Bold, Comic Italic, Comic Z. I guess Z means bold and italic. Uh, yeah, so we're batch processing and making a specimen like this for every font that I have on my Windows computer. DVDs are write protected somehow. IDK, how it works there. Yeah, uh, CDs, like CDs used to be like that. Uh, but then, like, like I plugged in a, or, or I put a CD into my CD drive a few weeks ago, uh, like when I was working on my taxes, and I have I have the option to use a CD as a USB drive. Like that, that's magical to me. Like I, I didn't know that was possible. So you can like copy things to a CD. Uh, it, it used to be like you would burn a CD once, and then it was uh, read only. Like you couldn't change the data on the CD drive after you burned it. But now, like. You can take things back off the CD. You can edit things on them. It's crazy. Uh, yeah, like TVs didn't watch you in the late 20th century, and <laughs> any references to that idea was a Yakov Smirnov joke about the Soviet Russia. Yeah. Uh, uh, it, I, I hate that, like, on the YouTube app on my smart TV, I, I have to watch ads. Like on my computer, I have ad block so that I basically never watch an ad on YouTube, but on my smart TV, I'm stuck watching ads. I just know that DVDs are right protected because I tried playing one on my laptop and it showed up as a regular drive instead of trying to play it. So I tried to copy the files off of it. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like you can't copy things off of it. Uh, there, there is like specialized software, which you might be able to use. Like there's something called handbrake, which can, uh, rip things off of, or, or copy things off of DVDs. The old data is still on CDs. It just hides it and appends it. Oh, okay. So, so you can never really delete things from a CD. I guess like, I guess if I use this as a flash drive, then it might eventually fill up all the way. I don't know. I, I only put like one file onto it so I didn't use up much space. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, I, I think I accomplished what I wanted to do tonight. Uh, so I'm not sure what I'm going to do the rest of the stream other than like scroll through all these font specimens. I'm only testing Latin letters. Uh, I am kind of curious to see how many of these fonts support non-Latin characters because my library can, but like, I don't know if the fonts do. Anyway, you have any advice for someone like me? Uh, I, I think your problem is very, very systemic. Like if, if there's one piece of technology that I liked and it doesn't exist anymore, then my advice was like, try to rebuild it yourself. But like if, everything stopped existing, then it's not really feasible to rebuild everything by yourself. Yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry, I can't help you. Why don't CDs just work like removable hard drives where you can add and delete whatever you want? Uh, yeah, I guess there's no way to delete them. Uh, 
I, I don't really know. I, I, I'm not a hardware guy. I don't know how like bits are engraved onto a laser disc. It's it's all magic to me. Corbel, Corbel bold, Corbel Z, and notice we don't have Corbel italic. Uh, because Corbell Italic has some issue where, like, the length of the file isn't a multiple of four bytes. So I can't verify the checksum, and my library just rejects it. So I have regular Corbell, I have Corbell Bold, and I have Corbell Bold Italic, but not Corbell Italic. I deeply miss the climate where technology respected the end user. Now cars have cellular modems and you have to pay a monthly subscription to use resistor coils that's in your property. Yeah, yeah, that's all annoying. I, I heard that they've stopped putting radios in cars. Like if you want to listen to AM or FM radio in a new car, uh, m maybe some new cars still have it, but like it, it's not, it's not necessarily given. So that's annoying. I miss it too. I miss that climate. Okay, so this this font overflows the uh, the canvas a little bit, but I feel like I don't belong here. Sorry. That's, that really is extra light. This one actually looks good because I'm not filling in the contours yet. The lighter it is, the better it looks in my render. At that point, you might as well hack your car. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't know if people are doing that, but farmers are hacking their tractors. Have any of you guys seen this? Uh, It's an article from Vice from like a few years ago. Yeah. Why American... There we go, I have to scroll through ads. The story is over five years old. Okay, why American farmers are hacking their tractors with Ukrainian firmware. There's a thriving black market of John Deere tractor hacking. Uh, I guess I'll put this link in the chat. I'm, I'm not going to like read the whole thing out loud on stream, but... Uh, since we got into the subject, maybe some of you guys will enjoy this. Close some of these tabs because I figured out the stuff that I was working on. I can close a lot of these tabs. All right. A lot of deja vu family fonts here. Hmm. Well, that doesn't. Oh, it's emojis. So I guess this font only has emojis. And then if you try to render a Latin character, that doesn't exist in the font. Let's verify that. Oh, I, I was in the middle of uh, changing this. I, I want two separate loops. You have a lowercase loop and an uppercase loop. So this one will only do lowercase, and then this one will only do uppercase. This is a little wet. I have like the body of the loop copied, uh, but it's just a stupid little bash script. That's not what I wanted. Okay, so that should fix the fact that like half of my files didn't get converted to PNGs. Uh, yeah, I, I would also like to catch errors and like count how many of these files rendered successfully versus how many ran into some kind of error. Uh, but I don't know if I feel like doing that now. 
Uh, I'll probably end the stream in like 10 or 15 minutes. I just wanted to do a short stream tonight. Uh, but I, I should be streaming again this weekend, if anybody wants to see that. So let me get this started again. Uh, yep, that will start running. I don't have a car. I'm going to design my own. Hold on, I clicked on something and can't see all the text. Okay. I'm going to design my own e-bike, and it will have a little red button that turns it into an unregistered motorcycle. Not that I want to cruise like me, but there's a D-bag and an SUV right behind me. I want to get as far away as fast as possible. Oh yeah, turn on the afterburners. I, I, hate, I hate the big SUVs with the really bright headlights. Like, a, a sedan with bright headlights is annoying too, but like when it's an SUV or, or a truck and the headlights are right at eye level going straight into your rearview mirror, it just totally blinds me. That's the worst. All right, well, I, I put these loops in the wrong order. I should have done the uppercase ones first because those were the ones that I didn't have. So now it's just redoing the lowercase ones, but I already have images for those. Anyway, uh, emoji. I wanted to see what was up with this emoji thing. Get distracted. Okay, yeah, so it's nothing but unknown glyphs because apparently this font is only emojis. And, oh, that's weird. Most fonts, like, they have an unknown character glyph, and if you try to render a character that doesn't exist, uh, it comes up as, like, a box with a question mark in it or something like that. SUVs are fucking evil. Yeah, like, the gas guzzling is bad enough, but, like, the bright headlights right at eye level, that's, that's just adding insult to injury. So I, I think I probably don't even have enough time to like scroll through all of these images. This one looks cool. Gabriola. Have to make a note of that. Unfortunately, like these are all probably Windows licensed, and I can't put these on GitHub or like include them in my unit tests in any convenient way. Or, or, like, or I could include them in like a local test, which only runs on my computer, but if I want to run something automated in a GitHub Actions workflow, there's no good way to do it. <laughs> Whatever this is, is nothing but unknown glyphs. Holo MDL 2. Huh. Where's Holo MDL1? Impact. This is the meme font, in case you didn't know. Every meme has impact with all uppercase characters. Okay. <laughs> I thought, I thought this was a bug, but this is just the name of the font file name. L10646. It's a nice name for a girl, I guess. Twenty years ago, the target demographic was D-bags, now it's D-bags, people scared of getting hit by D-bags with a bigger car than them, and soccer moms in denial. I'm not a soccer mom, I don't send my kids to soccer in a minivan, I send them to football in an SUV. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right about that. Yeah, it's, it's like, it's like driving has turned into competition. Where like it, it, it's now people who are scared of getting hit by D bags in a bigger SUV, so they buy an SUV not because they want an SUV, but just because they don't want to get hit by somebody else who has a bigger car than them. Huh. <laughs> uh, that shouldn't happen. 
Marlet. It's it's like a bunch of wingdings and icons, but instead of Latin characters rendering as unknown glyphs as they should, some of them have rendered to like the Windows icon. That's that's a little bit weird. I've got to assume that like it's not a bug in my library though, and it's just a weird font file that for some reason defines like the lowercase Q as a Windows icon. So that, that's what should be here. We have like A A Q Q. So this is lowercase Q. Or no, it's lowercase E. Sorry. One of my other specimens had Qs here. This has E's. I've never seen that before. Yeah. Uh, we, we can probably ver wait, where did, yeah, Marlet. We can probably verify this. So there's this cool website that I've been using called Font Drop. Uh, let me go to my Windows font directory. Oh, uh, no, I, I have to copy it. So the weird thing about File Explorer is usually you see like files and folders. If you go to C Windows Fonts, uh, first of all, it will freeze up for a minute. Uh, but then it will show you a list of fonts, and it doesn't show you the actual files. Uh, so like you can't necessarily drag and drop stuff from here. You have to like copy it to another directory first. Uh, so let me do that from here. What was it? It was Marlet, M-A-R-L-E-T-T. -T. I copied that to my scratch directory. Uh, And then we can use this website font drop where it will like show you a preview of a font if Chrome ever loads here. So here's this file that I copied from C Windows fonts. Uh, and you can preview it here. Yeah. <laughs> It's supposed to show you the name of the font here, but because this is a fucked up font that doesn't have Latin character glyphs, uh, it just shows you garbage. Like it shows you the file name here, but it's it's supposed to show you the font file name or the font name here too. Uh, yeah, it's just got a bunch of weird garbage. Uh, and this is oh, it's Unicode F057. That shouldn't be a lowercase Q. What CMAP format is this using? CMAP format 4. Okay. Yeah, I, I see the issue. It has very large numbers. Uh, when you have CMAP format 4, everything is supposed to be modulo, like 65,000, or whatever the maximum 2-byte integer is. Uh, so when, when I see a number this big, I assume it's supposed to be modulo, and I subtract something from it, and I get like a small negative offset rather than a huge positive offset. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure how to handle that in general. But yeah, apparently this is a bug in my library, and I should, I should not be rendering, I should not be rendering the letter Q as a Windows icon, like pet C. Uh, what do you think of Unicode supporting graphics? Uh, I don't really know a lot about Unicode. Uh, I, I happened to learn a little bit for this project. Like I learned just enough to figure out how to convert uh, UTF-8 to UTF-32 uh, because UTF-32 is the code point and when you look up a glyph index you have to know that code point. Uh, so that's UTF-32. Uh, but like UTF-8 is the most common encoding. So if you have a string, it's most likely UTF-8, and then you need to be able to convert that to a UTF-32 code point. Uh, but other than that, I don't really know a lot about Unicode. Uh, but are, are pseudo graphics like emoji, or is it different than emoji? Oh, like PETC. Uh, I, I don't know what PETC is, or or even how to pronounce that. Pet standard code of information interchange. 
Yeah, I, I don't know what that is. I'm sorry. Anyway, uh, I, I think I can scroll through a few more fonts here, and then uh, I'll probably end the stream in about five minutes. Oh, like the, uh, the card icons, like spades and hearts and diamonds. That's interesting. I mean, we have emojis. Uh, they might as well if they have unused code points. Like, Unicode can encode about a million characters, and that's probably more than we need for every existing language. So, like, you, you might as well use up some of the other stuff for, for emojis and pseudographics. I, I don't know if that's handled in the same way. I, I also know that Unicode has, like, reserved spaces where, like, the standard doesn't define a character there, but if your program wants to use Unicode and have, like, some private encoding, then you're allowed to use those things that are reserved. So, so I'm not sure if, if PETC works like that or if it's or if it's standardized. I don't know much about code. I know a little about Java because of Minecraft. Yeah, that's fine. You don't have to be a programmer. Uh, but but I'm, I'm surprised you're watching this stream if you... Well, I, I guess even if you don't know about code, maybe you're interested in code. Anyway, like I, I'm, I'm not even coding right now. I'm just looking at fonts. Hmm. That. Oh. This is interesting. So we have a queue with like extra holes in it. I got really into Minecraft about a year ago. I, I played it for like two weeks, and then <laughs> I haven't played it since. I, I would like to get back into it, but but I, I have trouble. Like I, I, I'm either in a programming mood or I'm in like a video game mood, and it, if I'm doing one, then I'm probably not doing the other one on the same day. Server development is hell in Minecraft. Oh yeah, I, I never like used my own server or anything like that. I, I just played in the single player mode. Oh, we have, we have Georgian fonts. That's why the Latin characters are nothing. Uh, yeah, so hosted a server once, it was so bad. I have, I have no experience with that. Oh, you do freelancing for Minecraft plugins. That's cool. Let's, uh, let's try some Georgian text, because Georgian is a very cool looking alphabet. Uh, I think we have some Georgian here. You basically just get destroyed by layers of abstraction. That, that sounds bad. Eventually I just made it whitelisted because I didn't want to deal with plugins and stuff. <laughs> it sounds like nobody has a positive experience with it, so I'm, I'm not going to try it. Let's, uh, let's try some Georgian text. Uh, my text editor probably isn't even going to render it. So I assure you that these are Georgian characters that I just copied and pasted. And let's do some more on another line. Uh, so this is my executable, and then I need the path to the font file. And it's Noto Sans Georgian. Regular? Let's do regular. Oh no, <laughs> they're still... Okay, so it did draw the Georgian glyphs, 
uh, but then it doesn't have glyphs for uh, numerals or or Latin characters. So that should be okay. Uh, and then I want to convert that to PNG too. PNG. That should fix the image. I'm not sure if this will refresh automatically. No, I think I have to close it and open it again. It was Noto. There are a lot of Notos in here. Regular. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, yeah, it did work. So, like, the Latin didn't work, but the Georgian at the bottom here, that worked. Hebrew. I, I don't know if I can do Hebrew. I, I can't do Arabic uh, because there's the right to left issue, but then Arabic also has, it, like, it, it's always cursive. So every letter in Arabic always connects to the letters on either, either side of it. And then each letter will have a different form, whether it's at the beginning of a word or the end of a word or somewhere in the middle or isolated just by itself without anything on either side. Uh, so I don't know how to handle that. Uh, and I, I don't know how to do Hebrew either. Uh, Hebrew is at least right to left. I, I don't think it has those other issues like, uh, like Arabic there. Uh, so why doesn't why doesn't Latin work? Latin is just normal characters. Uh, the problem is this font only has Georgian characters and it doesn't have Latin characters defined at all. Uh, you're right. Uh, Latin is easy to work with, it, at least if you're like a native Latin alphabet user like myself. But you have to use a font that defines those characters, and this font is Noto Sans Georgian, so it's like only Georgian alphabet. Uh, we go to, yeah, so these Latin characters work in this N Tyloo font because this has Latin glyphs defined. Uh, yeah, if, if glyphs aren't defined, then you get these boxes or tofus for unknown glyph. That just means that it, it's not necessarily a bug in the library or whatever is typesetting the text. It just means that the font that you're working with doesn't have that particular glyph defined. So, uh, where was it? Uh, it was Noto Sans Georgian. Yeah, so on that note, with some properly rendered Georgian characters, uh, I think I'm going to end the stream. So, uh, thank you to everybody who tuned in. I really appreciate it. And I will catch you next time. Bye.